Okay. So thanks for the invitation to give you some insights, old and new, in spin dynamics in reality, which we take with our X-ray microscope. So uh, maybe I have the pointer. So first short introduction into imaging techniques. It's normally so that the radiation you use uh, determines the resolution by the wavelength. And here you see the electromagnetic spectrum as a basis. And in this uh, region, we have light microscopes everywhere and nearly everywhere. If you go to uh, uh, shorter wavelengths, electron microscopes, and you have also scanning microscopes in the order which can go up to uh, atomic resolution. And the X-ray microscopy is just here in between. And you will ask why we need it anymore. No? And I try to convince you in this talk that these, uh, these X-rays can be useful for something. Because the first step is, uh, I, my, my talk is about dynamics. So the question is the time resolution. With, with light, you know, you can go to nearly inf infinite five attoseconds or attoseconds uh, time resolution. Uh, with electron microscope, the time resolution is more difficult. So there are a lot of attempts or not a lot, some, some attempts in maybe uh, 20 years to introduce dynamics in the electron microscope. It works, but it's, uh, it's really a hard task. Scanning probe microscope can be combined with radiation and they can also partly be uh, dynamic. But normally the scanning uh, techniques, also the NB center are slow. So, uh, I, and I want to show you here how we far we can go with X-ray microscopy, which provides a time resolution now of about 10 picoseconds. So why is this is uh, interesting? We are here in magnetism. So you see here the correlation of time and length scales. And uh, you see here, here we are in the macroscopic area. If we go lower to about to below one micron, we have these features, prominent features, uh, vortices, grimions, domain walls, domains, and uh, we have here the relaxation processes. The speed of data processing are in this area and also the uh, feature sizes. And lower, what I will not discuss today, are the atomic excess where you have femtoseconds and atomic scale. Uh, this is correlated, the time is correlated to frequency, and that's why magnetization dynamics is claimed to be interesting because you have the frequency, the combination of frequency and length scales of these uh, features uh, match excellently uh, with the today microwave techniques. The electron microscopes covered covers uh, cover about uh, this range. So you see time resolution is somewhat low. The care microscopes are with high time resolution, but limited by the wavelengths to about 300 nanometers. The NV centers coming up to get, uh, you can also get more and more dynamics, but uh, up to now the resolution is in combination with the dynamics reduced to about one micron. And there are only rare experiments. So here this is covered up to now, but what is here? Here, what is the really dominant part in the magnetization dynamics with microwaves? So first I want to tell you something about the basics of X-ray microscopy. The basic is that uh, we use uh, X-rays from the synchrotron. And the radiation is emitted since the electrons in the synchrotron are accelerated to the center. When they pass a helical ondulator, this is a magnet structure, then they are enforced to go under a certain movement, which will provide X radiation with variable polarization. But the electrons are uh, circulating in buckets which have typically nearly at any synchrotrons a time distance of two nanoseconds corresponding to the frequency of 500 megahertz. And the time width of these flashes, depending also 
on the operation mode of the synchrotrons can be well below 100 picoseconds. So this is a big advantage. And there are, it's, it's not a lab experiment. You have to go to a synchrotrons. There are about 60 synchrotrons available for this radiation. And here you see how they look like. They are all round, more or less, depending on the energy, larger or smaller. So I want to concentrate on the soft X-ray range, uh, which is defined between about 300 or 200 uh, electron volts to 2 keV. And what is um, appropriate for uh, these uh, using these radiation is the absorption cross-section is exactly known and tabulated. You can get them very well. So, and uh, you, uh, if you do soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy, it, you uh, monitor the absorption as function of energy. And these tables show you these profiles. And you see that if the energy reaches the level of an inner atomic <coughs> stay, uh, um, uh, level, then you uh, see that these edges are correlated to a certain atomic transition. This shows this is element specific. The, for the soft X-rays, the mean free path is not very large, about 100 nanometer to one micron. And this means that you have, they are excellent suited for looking at um, nano to micro particles and, and, stru and structures. But in reality, this is an ad libitum uh, uh, compound. In reality, the real absorption spectrum looks a little bit different. You see here at the edges, you have a strong enhancement at the L edges, which are a transition from 2P to a 3D level empty state, which defined angular momentum. And for the rear earths of 3D to 4F, they have such double like structures. And here you have a very strong absorption. But now we go, we go now to magnetism. Why are especially these edges, the L edges for the 3D transition metals and the 4F edges of the rear earths so interesting? First, uh, soft X-rays have nearly for any element of the periodic table an absorption line, but we are now interested into the magnetic basic elements here, the 3D and the 4Fs. And what you see here is an absorption spectrum in or absorption spectra in the region of these double peaks. So, and here is the given the profile of cases where the helicity is under parallel to magnetization or parallel to magnetization. And what you see that if you change the magnetization or the helicity for fixed magnetization, the absorption uh, strength or the absorption cross section uh, changes dramatically, which gives you an extremely strong magnetic signature. And uh, I cannot go more in detail, but for these edges, hold the so-called sum rules, which means that by analyzing these profiles, you get a quantitative estimation of spin and orbital moments in an element-specific manner, which is extremely appropriate. So, and this is for, uh, for the other rear earths and the 3D, it, it looks very similar. The strengths are similar. So this uh, show of, you can see with these uh, radiation, with the circular polarities uh, radiation, you can see moments up to one thousandth of bomb magnetons due to the high magnetic cross sections. But this is not all. Uh, since uh, the absorption profile shows what in what chemical state your absorbing atom is. You see here it for iron, for iron metal and iron oxide, it is different. And here are the dichroic signals. So the absorption profile is not only element specific, it's also chemical specific. And you, could, you can analyze your absorption profile in terms of uh, 
uh, valence states contributions and uh, chemical binding. But also at these edges, you can get what you, I only told you up to now about circular magnetic dichroism. Uh, you have also linear dichroism when you change the um, linear polarization of the light to parallel and anti, um, parallel and perpendicular to the um, magnetization or the antiferromagnetic orientation. You see here it for nickel oxide. You have also a signature for the antiferromagnetic orientation. It's a little bit lower the XMLD, but you can use it. You, I will show you later. So with this, you can think of if I have a magnetic layer where the domains are oriented out of plane and you send circularly polarized X-rays through, then you will get an image. Theory says that the contrast depends on the scalar product of the polarization and the magnetization. This is explained here. You have a magnetic vortex. This is such a closed loop. And in the middle, you have the vortex core, which is pointing out of the uh, plane, which means when the sample uh, is oriented perpendicular to the beam, you see only the magnetic vortex. And if you turn the sample, you see a projection of the in-plane magnetization. So we can see both by, by tilting uh, the sample. But the contrast depends significantly depends accurately on the projection of the polarization and the magnetization. So here are the first, uh, and this effect, the XMCD effect is already found in Wikipedia. Here you see these spectra for gadolinium ion alloy. And these are the first experiments uh, in 96, which we have taken at, uh, at Bessie 1. Perfect, you see here the domain structure of a gadolinium ion alloy with these uh, meander out of plane domains. And if you go from this one edge to the other with different contrast, the contrast reverses, which proves directly that you have magnetic contrast. But uh, so as easy as it looks like, it is not. So I show you the principle of the scanning transmission X-ray microscope. There are several other microscopes, but for dynamics, we need transition. I will show you this uh, in a minute. Here we have the storaging again. Then we, for spectroscopy, we have to monochromatize the sample. And for microscopy, we have to focus it. And this we do with a Fresnel zone plate. This is a, 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 a lens with concentric rings, which focuses the radiation on the sample and the resolution or the focal spot size is given by the resolution of the zone plate. And this determines from the width of the outermost ring, which are at the moment for sufficient diffraction efficiencies of about 15 to 18 nanometers. Then you have here an order selection aperture, then the sample uh, it, uh, is, is irradiated and the sample is raster moved through the beam and the, uh, as function of the position of the sample, you detect here the radiation with a fast X-ray photo avalanche diode. So I showed you before that the uh, penetration depth of soft X-rays is small. It's about below one micron. This means that the total sample stack must be relatively thin. But this is similar to transmission electron microscopes. There are also silicon membranes used. If you can prepare your problem you want to address on a silicon membrane, silicon nitride membrane, it is perfect. If you uh, have your system on a single crystal or a bulk system, then you have to fit similar as in TEM to fit thin the sample. This is possible, but it is, uh, it's an, to be honest, an, an effort. Then we need for magnetic uh, imaging, we need a magnetic field. This uh, we do by these, uh, this we do by these magnetic vector system, which provides at the moment a magnetic field, a vector field, we can adjust it in any direction of 250 millitesla. And then we want to cool it. We have here 
a, a very, very small uh, a cooling finger connected to a helium cryostat. And this provides a temperature at the moment of 15 Kelvin. But you see, so from this year, you get directly an information, uh, a feeling of the advantages and disadvantages. So oh no, first, I want to show you the reality. Here we are in the uh, Bessie, here's the Bessie storage ring. Here is our microscope located in a hutch. This is the microscope box. You can evacuate this. And this is here the interior. Here is the sample. Here is uh, the um, photo diet. And here is uh, the electronics for the time resolved measurements, which is all self made. And two times per year selection via a beam time committee. So it's not a lab experiment. And you see here in, enlarged again the sample. And this shows this brings it directly to the disadvantages and advantages. Disadvantage for every scientist is you have to go to a facility via a beamline application. And if you are lucky or uh, and you have not extremely good relationship to the beamline scientists, you get probably beam times two times per year. Spatial resolution is not uh, at the moment lower for transmission measurements, lower um, than 50 nanometer. And you have here, you see here the values. It's a very few space around the sample. So it's often tricky to, um, to have the sample in the right in, in environment, which is correlated to the limited external field and the limited temperature and the total thickness you have always to uh, realize that the x-rays go through but what is the advantage you have high precision scanning you can also turn the sample for tomographic measurements then you can move here the sample in set direction so you can easily defocus and find uh, quickly the field of interest so tomographic in imaging is possible photon in photon out means it's you are insensitive to magnetic or electric fields and you are nearly insensitive to any surface contamination which you have for beam or electron microscopy uh, things so you uh, have with the photon avalanche diode you can single photon counting every two one, one nanoseconds and you get typically with the realistic at the moment available uh, uh, brilliance at the synchrotron about 0.2 photons per punch. And I showed you before, you can use all the benefit of XMCD and XMLD, and also all benefits of normal absorption spectroscopy. Now, but now the time resolution. So uh, you know that uh, I hope <laughs> that the X rays come in flashes. This is, and then you have the sample here, a vortex on a strip line, and then you use, a, as for, for example, a pump pulse. You use a current pulse through this uh, strip line, which induces a magnetic field. And then you have here the, um, the a probe, the probe flashes of the synchrotron. And then you have here the excitation period, and you can shift the excitation period with respect to the flashes. And we have built a very sophisticated uh, FPGA system where we have a clever sorting clocked to the synchrotron uh, or uh, adjusted to the synchrotron clock. And we, uh, the um, um, image is taken in the following way that we set uh, the, uh, the image to one point and we go through the whole time series before we move to the next point. And the time resolution we, we do in the following. Uh, this uh, be uh, you can shift the excitation period with this with respect to the period of the synchrotron. And if you use for these delta t, you can use the following uh, uh, expression. You have here two two integers where r has to be smaller than m, and they have. But it's important that they have not common dividers. And this M is given by the channels you have to sort. In principle, it can be extremely large. And so this is the time resolution can be very well, from this technique, very well below nanoseconds. 
So at the moment, we have an excitation possibility up to 50 gigahertz of uh, pulses of 30 picoseconds excitation. So this fits all together. And, you, and now the limit, what, what limit us to higher frequencies is the width of the synchrotron bunch. You see here, this is the normal multi-bunch mode with all these flashes here. You have here a, a, a width of the synchrotron of about um, typically 45 picoseconds. Uh, now, due to Corona and so on, uh, they want to have more intensity for the protein crystallographer. So they have the top up mode where they fill always electrons in. And this increases uh, in uh, can or often increases the time resolution to 100 picoseconds. But two times per year, we have with lower intensity, the low alpha mode where the flashes have really nearly 10 picoseconds width. This means in principle, we can to go to 100 gigahertz. Now I show you typical results. First, static, very famous, van der Waal systems. We are not late. We have tried to image here. You see typical exfoliated flakes. But if you exfoliate them, you don't know what is really the thickness. You sometimes do AFM measurements, but you don't know how they, how they are stacked. And this is uh, and the advantage of X-ray absorption spectroscopy is you see you can directly deduce from the absorption the thickness. And then here we take two spectra at the thickness of 60 nanometer and the thickness of, um, of uh, here 25 nanometer. And we see directly, it's useless to measure here because the flake is completely oxidized. No dichroic signal and a typical oxygen profile. If we go to thicker, then we see here this absorption, uh, which shows us that the content of oxide is about 20%. So you have, we have all the, uh, the uh, possibilities of X-ray absorption and XMCD. And then the, uh, we can do high throughput, which is shown here. This is uh, an image you can take in one shift. And you can sit on these uh, positions and do via XMCD magnetization measurements locally any hysteresis behavior you want. And all these uh, pictures are taken in one hour, uh, in, in one shift of about 12 hours. So this is not a very sophisticated, you, you get the pictures directly normalized online and can take it immediately then at home. Now to famous skirmions. So this is a relatively old skirmion image from Kailitius uh, group um, from 2016. So we have measured here in these multi-layer skirmion samples uh, the, the uh, um, skirmion movement. And we see, uh, we saw clearly that some, image, um, some skirmions are moving and some are not. And, uh, and we see also that the sample is, is uh, heated. Here you see the velocity of the skirmions is not very high. And here again, a picture for the movement. Some skirmions move and some not. So this, is a, this introduces a difficulty to skirmion racetracks. This is because the, the pulse lengths are relatively long, five nanoseconds, or here 20 times 20 nanoseconds. This is what we say, it's more quasi-static image. Um, now we go to the ultra fast. Here we have again the vortex and the core, which is pointing out of plane. The, the vortex core is about in size 20 nanometer. And what we have done for the following experiment, we have positioned the vortex on a crossed strip lines, and we can introduce via these crossed strip lines a rotating magnetic field in plane. This is the sample. And now comes the very fast movies. The, the movie is uh, about 90 picosecond long. So this is a, for picoseconds are very fast. So you see here the simulation, what happens if you excite here via these uh, crossed or these rotating fields, you excite in-plane magnetic 
um, uh, uh, backward volume modes and these backward volume modes force or uh, it's expected that they force the vortex to a flip and this is the experiments 90 picosecond long you see directly that the vortex core flips in 90 picoseconds but only for one rotation sense the the uh, orientation or the polarization of the vortex determines the rotation sense and if you have another vortex orientation you have to change the rotation and this uh, pe people thought about <laughs> applications applications vortex core mrems which means vortex core is has a very high stability and we have shown that for a reasonable um these me these measurements go over over minutes uh, a half an hour and the samples survived we have relatively low power uh, low uh, current densities and extremely high speed the duty cycle is excellent is 0.2 we need no external field and we strictly po polarity selective and this is um, this is um, micromagnetic simulations because a 500 nanometer vortex core diameter is too is very uh, uh, large so we calculated what happens if we reduce the di uh, uh, the diameter and uh, you see uh, fortunately the expected pulse amplitudes are um, normally 40 percent higher than than uh, in in reality due to the granular structure of the permalloy and you see in principle it is possible to reach uh, switching times of 90 picoseconds in 250 nanometers and this would mean uh, the possible device structure is here but in comparison to a to a typical CMOS structure it is larger but what is not solved here this is the readout you can probably do it by by an mtj but this complicates the sample so this is a high, a nice idea but the reality is uh, is is that that it is uh, will be not realized in between 10 years but now i will show you some more movies so some kind of movie show again so this is nice if we we are staying at this vortex the vortex up to now had a thickness of 50 nanometers if you increase the thickness to 80 nanometer then in addition to the then uh, and then you force via these uh, backward volume waves here you force the vortex to rotate and this introduces standing spin waves hybridizing with the damon eschbach waves and this uh, and this results in uh, emission of spiral spin waves and uh, here are the dispersion relation are nearly linear this means that you have here relatively low k, k vectors here here is a wavelength of uh, 80 nanometers and then you see here if you increase the frequency the spirals get narrower and narrower up to about 100 nanometer where they do not decay uh, decay no do not disappear they start to decay so in this like here you see they 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 really decay and uh, we cannot see and this up to now we have not seen spin waves with wavelengths below 100 nanometer even we have the resolution to image 50 nanometer and this we interpret that this is correlated to the granular structure of uh, the uh, permalloy which you see here in the temcore section we expect that this this destroys all spin waves below 100 nanometer. But now a, a, a next uh, magnonic permaloy stripe. So the the, the, perma, the, the magnonic <coughs> stripe is located here on a copper strip line, and the experiment goes that way. You send a, a high frequency current through the strip line. Here is uh, the expected domain structure of this stripe. It's in plane. And then you excite the stripe. Here is the experiment. If you see here, are, these are the stripes. 
and then you excite it again let's so you you excite now huh? there comes my excitation i've disappeared and this is a real image of the spin waves by the way we can since xmcd is quantitative we can uh, deduce from our contrast the spin angle which is here about 1.7 degrees so and if you enlarge the the edges here it is evident how the geometry governs the development of the spin waves even in this very simplified stripe so now we go uh, to now we analyze via Fourier a procedure we analyze our films and here we get phase amplitude images and what we observe here what was astonishing that at a certain power we have here uh, it's weak but it is evident we have here <clears throat> a very narrow 100 nanometer spin wave which is not found in the dispersion relation this is the first k vector and this is the second k vector and since this is correlated to the power we uh, implement in uh, to the system and there are also other other uh, 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 things we observe which encourage us to uh, think that this is probably a tame sp space time crystal where the time structure induces here a folding of the brilliant zone and results in these uh, very short wavelengths here. But we have to repeat this, we have to uh, do also other systems, uh, but it was, they, they accepted in Fisreflettas, finally. <laughs> so, and this is also here, uh, you, now I show, you can play around, this is here uh, extended permaloy layer with a little hole inside and then uh, we change here the uh, the external field then you see uh, now maybe i have to start again yeah so then you see here some uh, uh, spin waves developing and here you put the hole far away and this can be interpreted as spin wave emitter and spin wave converter but to be honest where does these spin waves come from they come this is shown here by the micromagnetic simulations by irregularities at the rim of these hole which introduce strong oscillating in play uh, uh, perpendicular oscillating magnetic fields which directly implement here these short spin waves. Next is, uh, so uh, magnons are waves, so you can play around what we have built, tried to build. This was a magnonic Fresnel zone plate. Here you have the excitation line of the spin waves. Here as holes, the Fresnel zone plate. And what is shown here, that by uh, the external magnetic field, here is the focus, focal point. You can shift the focal point of the zone plate around. And this is, this is funny, could, could be also published. So in principle, is, it is possible to transfer the uh, optical um, um, Fresnel zone plates also to the magnonic zone plate, to the magnonic case. And then again here, this is a magnon lattice. This is a permaloy stripe with holes in it, cut it by FIP. This is the copper strip line where we send the current through at 4.2 gigahertz in an external field of 30 millitesla. We have here the expected long range Damon Eschbach waves. And if we turn the field off, we have only backward volume located below the strip line. And if we pulse the system with a 100 picosecond burst, we see here at the edges this localized mode appearing. 
here at only 250 nanometer. So we have here a high resolution of a magnetic feature, a time dependent with 50 nanometer. You see in these, uh, from this experiment also that these uh, magnetic lattice works as a so-called magnetic, uh, magnetic frequency comp at, uh, at um, equidistant frequencies. You see here maximum spin wave amplitudes arising. But if you turn the current on, then this disappeared uh, normally at uh, current densities above five times 10 to 11 amps per meter, which I uh, we, we, uh, always very often found to be uh, limits for all these dynamics. But all these, to uh, show you that this is high throughput, all the picture here in this slide have been taken in a total measurement time in six hours. Now, uh, magnonics you cannot do without ferromagnetic garnets. This is here to show, uh, this is here a um, gallium yik system with very low magnetization. You see here these some kind of spirals uh, uh, emitting. We have here a large, this is a very large field, field of view. But you see here, if you look closer, we don't know why here we have a certain uh, uh, irregulations in the in the emission. We think that this is correlated to the stress in the sample due to the uh, pr preparation of these copper strip lines. We always saw that the magnon performance is extremely sensitive on the sample preparation and a little bit of stress and a little bit of irregularities or defects uh, can strongly influence the magnon uh, performance. Here again, now we, this is at 3.5 gigahertz and relatively high magnetic field. Now we go to lower frequencies, 118 megahertz, 100 millitesla. And here you see that you have here domain movements. We cannot explain and we don't know why they are so uh, uh, here located. This, uh, this is the direct picture and this is the difference picture. It looks really artist-like, but you see here that the whole dynamics in these even, these are liquid phase epitaxy gallium week, the best you, you, can, you can get. You have also strange features in the performance. Then we turn the magnetic field off. Due to the low magnetization, we have these out of plane warm domains, warm domains. And here are the, um, the difference picture. You see nicely that in the domains here, the, uh, uh, the uh, domain uh, walls here are uh, going around. So this is also a funny picture. <laughs> By the way, due to the low magnetization of this gallium week, if you have a, a very small field out of plane, you directly get bubbles. Or uh, maybe you would like to say these are skirmions. And now, uh, uh, Liquid phase epitaxy is a difficult procedure. It's becoming more and more available. Here we have tried to look what happens if you sputter the yik. And you see here, <laughs> you see here, sputtered yik has these, all these domains uh, or these uh, grain boundaries. And a really, this is irregular, uh, seems to be irregular. But if you look, at only one grain, you have here a really nice domain pattern inside the domain, which seems to be reflected at the grain boundary. So there is, uh, in Germany, we say Luft nach oben, air to the top. And if you reduce the magnetic field, these sample turns also out of plane, and you get similar uh, in the dynamics, similar pictures as here. So this, and, and then you can analyze this. You see this here again, nicely. These are by, by the way, 200 nanometer uh, wavelengths at these correlated to the relatively low frequency. So now let's come to XMLD. This is the XMCD for YIC 
This is the XMLD linear magnetic dichroism. This is only a demonstration that you see here the XMCD, and in the XMLD, you see only the uh, antiferromagnetic component of this system. This is only a proof of principle that we can as easy do XMLD dynamics as we do X, XMCD dynamics. And here again, this is a window uh, 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 X, XMLD image or movie of uh, a window YIC samples. And I am not allowed to show our very recent results where we saw in a perfect one domain antiferromagnet that really pure antiferromagnetic spin waves with a speed of up to 100 km per second. But this is top secret and very recent results. So now before I summarize here, what can be expected in the next 10 years, probably we can go uh, below, we can go to the wavelength limit. This is depending on the detector systems. If we can uh, um, uh, uh, have a, 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 or, or a diode array with parallel readout, we can in principle by tachographic imaging go through this range. And it is in principle possible to uh, narrow the um, synchrotron flash below one picosecond. This is an effort, but it's not out of reach. So this can be probably in the next decade reached. Now I want to summarize. Uh, I hope I could show you that time-resolved transmission X-ray microscopy provides a unique access to magnetization dynamics with picosecond nanometer resolution, large field of view, and very high throughput. The basis of XRS, XMCD, X, uh, XMLD provides you directly the sample thickness, element and chemical quantitative sensitivity to local magnetic spin and orbital moments. We have not separated up to now orbital moments, but uh, or orbital dynamics, but it is possible. The, uh, this, uh, the uh, drawbacks are we have a limited sample thickness that we have to have sophisticated preparation route. But this you have for any TEM sample, and no one complains. Um, you have limited space around the sample, which reduces the external magnetic field for uh, maybe to one millitesla. And we can probably reach a temperature of 10 Kelvin. But we, get, we already get unique insights into magnetization dynamics and the influence in, of importance and the limits of sample quality and geometry. And we can, we have access to ferromagnets, but only, but also unique access to antiferromagnets. And this is the acknowledgement a lot of people contribute. And also here is the reality, <laughs> what uh, the beam line, the beam time means. And normally the youngest of our collaborators have the night shifts. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> clapping sound for you. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for all this, uh, for this uh, uh, going through all of the possibilities of the dynamics uh, you can do in the systems. Um, so for, uh, the, the question uh, is open for questions. So if you like to ask questions to Gisela, please uh, raise your hand um, and I'll start. Uh, I'm curious to see in the, in the magnetic systems, in most of the things that you are seeing, are they uh, coherent or decoherent um, uh, magnons that you are playing? With? Do you can you reach the point of of uh, playing with coherent magnon systems? Yeah, they are. They are. They are normally co coherent, while otherwise we would they would uh, smear out. Yeah, they are. You, you see, we we take uh, uh, a lot of time sequences. Yeah, billions and billions. Mm -hmm. And so they are, this is a coherent process. Okay. Uh, Philip, uh, you go ahead and ask ah, a question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that nice talk. It was really impressive to see all these very nice illustrations. Um, I would have maybe a follow up question of Hayo's question. Is there any way also to make the incoherent excitations maybe? Visible or at least excitation? Oh, 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 I have to think how. Uh, 
how this would work. So I uh, maybe if you uh, if you uh, look at the time evolution of coherent and decoherent processes, you can get it. Okay. Yeah, because that would also be mm -hmm. something which which could be interesting. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you allow me a second question, that the, the time space crystal that's looked very interesting to me. But what I did not completely understand: what determines the wave factor of this second mode, this K two, which you did not expect? Yeah. This is uh, 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 it is explained at a four magnon scattering where one magnon is provided by the uh, time crystal. Okay, and that, but that has some certain K vector then also? Because... Yeah, yeah, this is a K vector which transfers uh, uh, in the second brilliant zone. Okay, okay, then thanks. Yeah, we, I think yeah, then I have we, to have, take a closer have look increase, on we, we have at the same frequency an increase of the K vector. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess uh, there's an there's an order in with uh, double or half the uh, frequency of the of the yeah, driving yeah. frequency, right? Yeah, That's the whole idea the, of that. Uh, it spontaneously breaks. Yeah, uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, uh, to to really prove that it's a time crystal, we uh, we have uh, all uh, the features which are necessary. But maybe it's not com complete. Yeah. So we have really to uh, test several things. We saw in this time crystal a strong dependence on the driving force. Yeah. As as it is is expected, and we see also in the time evolution we see some uh, periodicity in the time de development. But to be uh, these the the frequency of our time crystal matches directly the frequency of the space crystal which is a little bit strange okay. yeah yeah olivia um can ask a question yeah hello gisela thank you for the very nice overview i have a question as regards the polycrystalline permaloy and yeah. the kind of cutoff in your spin wave around 100 yeah. nanometer wavelength yeah. Uh, wouldn't you expect um, that it also affects the effective damping uh, for wavelength above 100 nanometer? And can you extract a kind of a scaling law for these? Do you expect that? Do you observe that the damping is indeed depending on the wavelength? Uh, it it seems to uh, be yeah. So uh, normally, if we increase the uh, or we decrease the wavelength, so uh, we don't know exactly whether it comes from the damping. It it looks really like a decay mechanism, yeah. So uh, that they they are uh, uh, cannot that the spin waves cannot develop if the granular system is in the order of the wavelength. It must be larger. Don't know whether this this. Uh, so, so the damping of our permalloy is the standard damping. Yeah. So, so sorry, I was not uh, thinking of really condensed matter dumping, but more an effective dumping or lo looking into the the decay length that you observe. But I would expect uh, an influence on the granular structure beyond the hundred nanometer cutoff. That if you are slightly above, I would not expect that suddenly you reach the the full propagation and there is no more impact. Yeah, so this is this uh, the propagation length depends also strongly on the system. So we see our spin waves normally up up to a range of in in permaloy up to fifty nanometer, uh, fifteen micrometers. This is so. This is typical. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm going to be promoter. So Boris will join in a second. I hope. Uh, Boris, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hello? Yeah. Boris? You spoke. Did you hear me? We can hear you very low, unfortunately. Well, let me repeat once more. 
Okay. Now we is it better now? It's a little better. I don't know what to do. Okay, I'll try to speak loudly. First of all, thank you for a very interesting talk. And uh, my question is about antiferromagnets. About anti application to antiferromagnets. Okay, application to antiferromagnets, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this is probably at the moment for really imaging uh, antiferromagnetic magnons, yeah, the only way you can get it. And uh, we, are, we, uh, we have proved that it works up to, I think, 20, 30, it, it's, it's, it's improving every week, uh, up to, I think, 20 to 30 gigahertz. And we see... Uh, we see them, uh, uh, I would say, easily. What is what is often difficult to get a good sample because the antiferromagnets have, have awful domain structures which destroy your antiferromagnetic magnons, probably. And so uh, we, the prerequisite is to have as uh, as monodomainic as possible and this has to be in a thin sample which induces big big challenges but it is possible thank you okay um any further questions from the audience if you have questions please raise your hands uh i don't see anybody okay uh matthias no so with that, um, well, I would like to thank the 120 uh, people that showed up uh, between here and, and, uh, and the YouTube channel uh, for listening in to this wonderful overview of all the great capabilities and the, and the dedication of these poor students with the 80 hours looking at spin waves. <laughs> I hope you. I hope you at least allow them to order pizza or something in the between yeah. and go to the bathroom. Uh, but they're extremely dedicated students, you know, uh, just as dedicated as mine. I hope. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and thank you once again. I'll stop now the the streaming here in this side.